Thank you. There. Um, I was just going to suggest that anyone down the back feels like they want, if they want to move forward, I realise sometimes people like being at the back, like I do in a yoga class, but um, if you do want to move forward, please do, so we can bunch up and feel like a bit of a community here today. Um, so, I mean, our session today doesn't really need any introduction. As, as someone has just said to me, if there were, you were ever going to introduce a speaker who no, needs no introduction, it is Satish Kumar. <laughs> but I will just say, I had the honor of meeting Satish about 10 years ago, and um, I've had um, the great joy of working with him in many different ways. And most recently, um, Satish has been holding daily me uh, weekly meditation sessions uh, with us at the Oxford Real Farming Conference online for about the last 18 months now. That's right. um, and it's been the most wonderful way to um, bring community together around uh, meditating on the land and on soil. Um, and we've reached out to farmers and food producers and land lovers all over the world, which has been fantastic. But um, Satish is probably one of the busiest people I've ever, ever met. <laughs> he travels all over the world. Luckily, these days, you don't walk all over the world, do you, Satish? <laughs> Satish did once walk 8,000 miles, starting in Delhi and arriving in Washington on a uh, peace protest, which lasted four years. These days, he tends to travel and uh, promote his incredible array of books, the most recent of which is Radical Love, which is um, an incredible book that I encourage you all to read. Um, he's also the founder of Schumacher College. And uh, I think I probably, there's many, many other things I could mention, but That's I'll enough. hand over to you, Satish. So thank, <laughs> thank you, you, welcome. Thank you. Thank, it had been an incredible uh, relationship between myself and Fran and through that between Schumacher College, Resurgence, and Oxford um, Real Farming Conference, and, and all the activities that we do. So it is a great honor, privilege, pleasure, joy for me to be here this afternoon. Thank you, Fran, for including me. Um, I would like to start with a, a short, one minute meditation. Please bring your right hand in front of you. The right hand represents the world. Just see in this hand the whole universe. The sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the earth, and yourself. But yourself particularly, bring your left hand, and then unite the two worlds together. The world and yourself. So when you greet someone with both hands together, see the whole world in that one person and that one person in you. And you in that person and you in that whole world. So this unity of life, that is the fundamental principle of soil, soul and society. So with that unity, of right hand and left hand representing the world and the self. Thank you. Um, all great movements have encapsulated their vision, their values, and their ideals in three words. Because two words create duality. The third word creates unity. So, French Revolution was about egalité, liberté, fraternité. But I was not quite satisfied with that trinity because it's all about human equality, human fraternity, human solidarity, does not include our relationship with the natural world and does not include anything about ourselves. Then the Christian Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is a wonderful Trinity, but Father is good, but what about the mother? The Son is good, what about the daughter? Holy Spirit is good, what about holy matter? For me, matter is also holy, sacred, 
Our body is sacred. And it's a temple of our soul. So there are many other trinities like that. In our, this farming, agriculture, environment, ecology, all these new ideas that we are here gathered to celebrate, what will be a new trinity for our time and for our movement? And I have presented this a book, I have, Soil, Soul Society, I have presented this new trinity for our movement, new trinity for our time. And that new trinity is soil, because we are all farmers, growers, gardeners. I'm only a very small grower, only two acres of land, but I have 15 apple trees, and I planted them 40 years ago, and they are giving me lots of apples. So many apples that I can't eat them. So I make apple juice. This year, I made 200 bottles of apple juice. And a whole year that lasts. My wife is a great gardener. We have two acres. Soil is very close to my heart. And soil, soil association. All our people, all of you who are gardeners, we think of the seed. We think of food growing. We think of all the apples and all the cauliflowers and asparagus and potatoes and all the vegetables and all the flowers, we look at them. And we say, wonderful, we have such a good crop. But without soil, there's no crop. Without soil, there are no roses. Without soil, there's no lavender, all the beautiful fragrance. Without soil, there's no asparagus. With our soil, there are no apples. But we hardly talk about soil. And we think soil is dirty. Dirt is dirty. I say to my friends who think dirt is dirty, I say, no, dirt is not dirty. The soap is dirty. Wash your hands with soil, not with soap. In naturopathy, Soil is the medicine. When I was in India, Mahatma Gandhi was a great exponent of soil. And he put soil on his tummy to take, soak all the poisonous elements of the body, soaked by the soil. Put soil on your head. If you have a headache, lie down and put soil on your head. Naturopathy is a soil soil treatment. Soil is the source of life. You know the word soil in Latin? Humus. And the word human comes from where? From humus. So human beings are literally soil beings. Think of yourself as soil being. Human being as a soil being. We are soil. Our body is soil transformed. We are earth. We are earthlings, soil beings. The food we eat, all the beautiful names I mentioned of foods and flowers, they are all soil transformed. Sweet oranges and apples, Soil transformed into apple. The tree, we plant the apple seed in the ground, that little tiny seed, and the soil gives its body to make that seed into a trunk and branches and leaves and blossoms and apples and juice. All that comes from the soil. So please remember, our new trinity has to be based in soil. With our soil, there's no life. And our farmers in the mainstream industrial farming, not in this audience, but outside in the opposite of this hall, they think the soil is only a source to make money. Nature is only a source to make money, make profit. Nature has become a means to an end, and the end is money. Money is nothing. Money is only an idea. It's a good idea. It's a good exchange idea. 
But real wealth is soil. People talk about bankers and business leaders and industrialists, and they call them wealth creators. Sorry, they are not wealth creators. They are wealth counters. They count money. They don't create wealth. The farmers are wealth creators. The real wealth is soil and the food which grows out of the soil. And your talent and your skills and your patience and the, the way you wait for the seed to become a tree for 10 years, you have to wait. That patience is wealth. Human skills, human imagination, human creativity, that is real wealth. Communities are real wealth. Soil is real wealth. Nature is real wealth. So those who create soil, build soil. I had a great privilege of meeting Lady Eve Balfour, the founder of the Soil Association. I visited her uh, in Suffolk on her garden and farm and, and house. And I asked her, your garden is looking so beautiful. What do you do? What is your great skin secret? And you know what Lady Eve said? I do nothing. I just take care of the soil. I make compost and put compost into the soil, onto the soil. And that's all I do. Rest soil looks after everything. She said to me, 90 year old, wonderful, wise woman, she said to me, if you take care of the soil, soil will take care of everything else. So you and I, we gardeners, our real wealth, real treasure, real source of our well-being is soil. If we look after soil, everything will be looked after. In England, we, in Britain, we have forgotten the soil. This is why Britain is facing so many problems. I want Sunak, Rishi Sunak, to garden. <laughs> Be a gardener. <laughs> then you will solve the problems of Britain. Problems are not in boat people or immigrants or uh, or um, inflation or all the things they talk about, waste their time in parliament every Wednesday, argy bargy. What a low level. St Stama, become a gardener. So if we look after soil, our country will be beautiful. Our country will be prosperous. Our country will be well-being and happy and joyful. It's a soil which is real England land, England, we have forgotten the land of England. Let's love the land, the soil. But soil is soulful. Soil is not just a dead material, just inanimate. And so I want to put soul at the second of our trinity. We are soulful, we are not just body. We have spirit, we have consciousness, we have imagination. We have creativity, we have love in our heart. We have compassion, we have kindness. All these values nobody talks about. They only talk about money and profit and business and industry and technology and AI and, and uh, smartphones and more computers every year, new computers. But nobody talks about compassion and kindness and generosity and love and friendship and relationship and community and the family and friendship. Nobody talks about. So I want to put soul in our trinity. Without soul, without spirit, without consciousness, without love and friendship and a sense of community and unity of life, all these values which are immeasurable. You cannot measure friendship. You cannot measure love. You cannot measure kindness, compassion, generosity. But these are the values which sustain our lives. Like soil sustains our physical world, compassion and kindness and love and generosity sustains our non-physical, no metaphysical uh, world. And so let's put soil, soil back into the soil. Let's put soul back into our body. Let's put soul into our society. Let's put soul in our business. 
Let's put soul in our universities, Oxford, Cambridge, big, big universities, soulless, soulless. All these science and technology and politics and economics and everything measured, measured, measured without compassion, without kindness, without generosity of spirit, without human relationship. And this is why we have become so miserable and, and lacking all our trust in humanity. Always locks and keys and security and this and that. No trust, no friendship, no trust in humanity. My heart bleeds when I see this lack of trust in our society. Trust is the key. Trust is the soul quality. Let's bring trust back. Let's bring compassion back. Let's bring love back into our farming, into our gardening, into our business, into our industry, into our parliament, into our, our newspapers, into our media, social media. Bring soul back with our soul, with our trust, with our compassion, with our kindness. There's no life. You can have millions and billions and trillions of dollars and pounds and euros and you have no soul, no spirit and no kindness and no love. They're all waste. Useless money without compassion. Money becomes useful if you have generosity of heart. Money becomes useful and helpful if you have kindness in your spirit. If kindness and compassion and love is missing, soul is missing, no industry, no business, no farming, no education, no university are any use to me. So bring soul back into our lives. And then society. We are not just individuals. Famously, Mrs. Thatcher said, there's no such thing as society. She may rest in peace in her, her grave, but sorry, Mrs. Thatcher, without, we are not just human individuals. We are members of a community. And without, a, irrespective of any nationality, any religion, any race, any gender, any political beliefs, any, any other economic systems, anything else, before all those things, we are human community. Why we have war in Ukraine? Why we have war in Gaza and Israel? Why we have animosity between India and Pakistan? Why we have conflict between America? We are a small human community. We are only 8 billion people in, the worst, in this world, planet Earth. We are all humans. We can call anybody in any corner of the world. We are one humanity. Before you are Christian, before you are Muslim, before you are Buddhist, before you are Hindu, before you are English, before you are American, before you are Russian, before you are Gaza uh, Palestinian, before you are Ukrainian, before you are Russian, before you are anything else, all these labels, forget them. You are human being, human community. We are all members of one humanity. If we forget that and fight on, kill each other in the name of religion, kill each other in the name of Gaza or Palestine or Israel or Ukraine or Russia or China or India or whatever. What stupidity. We say Sunak has been Oxford or Cambridge or somewhere educated. We say that Biden has been to Harvard or Yale or somewhere, big university. They are supposed to be educated people. They are not educated. They are totally stupid. <laughs> totally stupid. <laughs> Killing our fellow human beings in the name of religion. Killing our fellow human beings in the name of nationality. Killing our human beings into the name of political system or economic system or whatever. All these labels are secondary. Primarily, we are a human society, human community. So, I give you this very simple formula. I'm not prepared to kill anyone for any good cause. There are no causes in the whole world good enough for which I can kill a single human being. There are good causes for which I can die for myself. I'm prepared to give my life for good causes. Mahatma Gandhi gave his life. Jesus Christ gave his life. Martin Luther King gave his life. Many, many people have given their lives for good causes. But there's no cause good enough for which I can kill anyone's life. Life is sacred. 
And so that's my idea of society. And social justice is part of that, social equality is part of that, social harmony is part of that. So nature is the source of life. And nature and us are not separate. We are nature. We are soil beings. Where nature simply means, nature simply means birth. Like a mother before birth has a prenatal check. After the birth, she had a postnatal check. The word natal and nature are related. Natal means birth. Everything which is born is nature. We are born, so we are nature. How can we say nature is out there, separate from us? Mountains and forests and rivers and animals and birds are nature, and we humans are not nature. We are nature. We are as much nature as the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the animals in the forest and the mountains and, and the trees. We are nature. So if we can understand that, then that's a nature, that's a soil, that's environment, that's ecology, that's a part of our existence. And then we have love for nature and love for ourselves because we are a whole universe within ourselves. Love yourself. Can you remember? Quite often we forget, we think, I will love my wife, I will love my children, I love my parents, I will love my neighbor, I will even love Russians and Americans and Chinese and, and Gazians and Muslims and so on. But can you also love yourself? So that's a soul quality, that you love yourself. And you extend, and love is not ego. Love is not that I am better than you. I love myself so I can love you. Because I am the world, I am the universe. The whole universe is in me and I am in the universe. So that love, that's a radical love that you mentioned in my book. But for this uh, audience and this talk, my book, Soil, Soul, Society, is more relevant. So if you want to expand on these ideas further, you can read my book, Soil, Soul, Society. But in a nutshell, we need a new trinity for our time, new trinity for our movement, uh, for real farming, and real agriculture, and agroecology, and food systems, all those things are wonderful. And the, for them, we need a bigger picture, a bigger vision, a bigger holistic ideal. And that ideal I have encapsulated in three words. Soil, nature, soul, spirit, consciousness, society, human community. Soil, soul, society. My dear friends, I present you with this new trinity for our time. If you like it, please take it and talk about it and spread the word around. If you don't like, please forgive me. Thank you. We have 20 minutes uh, or so for questions. I, I didn't want to speak too long because you are all very wise and learned people. I don't need to say too much. You all get the idea. But if you have any questions or comments or addition to anything, please ask and I'll be delighted. And there'll be a microphone which will come to you to, to, to make the voice sound. While we're just looking for a question from the floor, Satish, there has been one that's come on online, which I yeah. thought was um, worth asking you. She says, I know this is more of a philosophical question. This is Frida, keeping it real. But what do you put around your apple trees to keep the soil? What, we, what do you put around your apple trees to keep it, the, the soil around your apple trees? OK, fertile? OK. It's very simple. Leaves in the autumn are a very good source of compost. And I go out of my house in the street, on the road, and sweep all the leaves and bring them into my house and make compost. That's a very simple. And I put that compost around my trees and also in the garden. Then anything, nature provides you food for itself. So when you eat oranges or bananas or apples, you have a peels, cauliflowers, peels, or, or leaves, or, or anything, whichever you can't eat. And nature provides itself. Take that and put it in the compost. Even in Oxford, even in London, 
Even in New York, wherever you are, you can make compost. There's no place, there's no excuse. You can't say, I'm living in London, I can't make compost. You can make compost, but you have a kitchen. You are eating food. There's a kitchen. And leaves are everywhere. So I collect, I'm, I think compost is the gold. Real gold. All those ring you have your gold, that's okay, ornamental. But the real gold is compost. So I collect every leaf in my road and street, and, in, and I have two acres, and I have lots of trees. I collect the leaves uh, uh, every autumn and put them on a big heap, and then that becomes, within a few weeks, it's a compost, and that compost is golden. So I never, never in 44 years of my garden in Devon have used a single ounce of any chemicals. Just pure nature. From, that is the beautiful, beautiful principle of nature, the cycle. Nature is cyclical. The economy of nature is so wonderful. It's everything provides for itself. Regenerative, cyclical. Leaves become food for the soil. This is why every autumn, wind comes so that leaves come back down and go back into the soil and make the soil rich again. Nature has solution for everything. Nature is my teacher. Of course, I have wonderful teachers at Shumaha College like James Lovelock and Bandana Shiva and Vinoba Bhave and Mahatma Gandhi and so on. But even greater than Mahatma Gandhi, even greater than Bandana Shiva, greater than Martin Luther King, greater than James Lovelock, Nature is my teacher. So, leaves. 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 There you go. Collect your leaves. <laughs> Collect your leaves and put them on the compost. Thank you, Satish. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, not, not surprisingly, that there is no cause uh, worthy of killing somebody. And yet you also said that there would be a cause for laying your own life. I'm curious about that. Uh, uh, well, I also said... That there is a cause for laying down your own life yeah. in the, in a, for a good cause. Yeah. So um, the lady down here is saying she's curious about that. What cause could, yeah. could I give my life to? Is that what it is? Yeah. Um, <coughs> you know, our society is evolving. And in, during that hi long history of human evolution, we had slavery, we had racial discrimination, we had gender discrimination, we had imperialism, we had colonialism, we had racism, we had many, many issues and for which we want to work. So Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, uh, the Buddha, Jesus Christ, and many, many other wonderful women who, uh, suffragette women who fought for uh, women's rights and so on. So these people have to give their lives. So I'm prepared to give for good cause, for ecology, for environment, for local economy, for good farming. Any good thing, I'm prepared to fast, I'm prepared to die. If somebody kills me for that cause, I'm prepared to die. But I'm not prepared to kill anyone. So non-violence is to take suffering upon yourself voluntarily, rather inflict suffering on somebody else. That's the basic principle of non-violence. So non-violent action, to improve our end slavery, and gender discrimination, and racism, and colonialism, and anything which you think is unjust for humanity and for nature, then you can struggle for that, and you can bring suffering upon yourself, and you voluntarily. Mahatma Gandhi said, he will go to jail like a bridegroom goes to wedding chamber. So voluntarily, you are prepared to give your life for a good cause, but you are not prepared to take anybody's life for any good cause. That's it. Yes, behind you. Do you want to pass the microphone over? Yeah. Right. Satish, are you optimistic? And if so, why? Okay. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. Um, I am an optimist. Because, as I said, we are evolving. There's no time when we can sort of say that we have stopped and now nothing will change. We are evolving. And we have seen in the human history how many things were wrong and we improved them. Apartheid came to an end in my lifetime. Berlin Wall came down in my lifetime. 
Women have much more right now than ever before in my lifetime. And so I have always hoped that industrialism, uh, materialism, uh, kind of exploitation, these are all human-made institutions. So what can be made by humans can be changed by humans. We are capable of changing. We are capable of improving. We are capable of evolving. And therefore, I have a hope. If you are a pessimist, you cannot be an activist. In order to be an activist, you have to be an optimist. If you are a pessimist, you could become a journalist. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I know the person who's asking the question is, is a good journalist. You are an exception. <laughs> but generally speaking, you could be a pessimist, a journalist, or some critical person. But to be an activist, you have to hope in your heart that yes, things can change. When I started editing the Surgeon's Magazine, not one single windmill was producing renewable energy in 1973. Center for Alternative Technology started in 1973. Not one solar panel was producing renewable energy. And people said, you are naive fools that you think that solar panels and windmills can meet the needs of British uh, um, energy systems? No, impossible. And now, 35% of our energy coming from renewable sources. So we were optimists in 1973 at starting Center for Alternative Technology and starting Resurgence Magazine and Ecologist Magazine. So we have to remain always optimists. So I would like, urge you all, never give in to pessimism. Never give in, uh, uh, never give in to um, uh, hopelessness. We can change. We are capable of changing. World can change. We can improve things. We can make life better and better and better. It's an evolution. It's not at the end where you can say, now we have reached a, a final goal, nothing can change. Things can change and, and things can improve. So with that, and if I can't, I act without any expectations. This is my principle. My optimism is not that I should see the results in my own life. I might go, but my future generations will say, oh, Satish laid some good foundation, we can build on that. So act without expecting results in your own lifetime. Action itself is your own reward. So I do my best. I walk around the world, I start the magazine resurgence, I start at Schumacher College, I come here, I do my best in the service of humanity with hope that things will change. But what happens in my, not in my control. Results are not in my control. Outcome is not in my hand. What I will achieve or not achieve is not in my hand. But I can act and act and act with the hope that things will change. If not in my lifetime, in uh, my children's lifetime. So with that hope, I act. So I always urge people never to give in to hopelessness and, and, and pessimism. Always act with commitment that yes, I'll do my best to serve the world. I'll do my best to serve the humanity and serve the earth. And what happens? Results are not in my hands. Universe will give me some results. So with that hope, I act. So I think optimism and hopefulness is the, is the power which makes you an activist. Thank you, Satish. Woo. I'd just like to apologize to the online audience because yes. the, the, the screen is glitching, I'm afraid. So we haven't actually got, I don't know if there are any more online questions, but I can't actually access them. So I do apologize, but we've got time for more questions from the floor. If anyone's got, right at the back there. Right on the back, right. yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name's Rai Hickman. I'm a PhD researcher from Rothamsted. Um, I was interested when you said scientists are kind of fixated on measuring um, and lack compassion. So I'm wondering how we reconcile the current need to measure environmental indicators, including soil health, uh, with this lack of compassion in science. I guess, in other words, how do we imbue science with compassion? Thanks. Do you mind just saying that again? So uh, just, just, brief, just briefly. How do we imbue science with compassion? How do we view science with compassion? OK, yeah, good. Thank you. Science and compassion. Science and spirituality, I can say. 
Science is about measurement. Science deals with material things, measures things. And we need it. We need scientific mind, we need open mind, we need inquiring mind. Science is very helpful. But science is dangerous without compassion. Science is dangerous without ethical, spiritual guidance. Science can create nuclear bomb. Science can create genetic engineering. Science can create anything. Without ethical, spiritual, compassionate values, science can be dangerous. So science needs spirituality. Science needs compassion. Science needs humanity. And those are the values which spirituality brings. But spirituality can also be dangerous without science. Mm. Because you can be very dogmatic. You can be very narrow-minded. You can say, my truth is the best truth and nobody else has truth. I'm the right, everybody else is wrong. Religions, in the name of spirituality, have brought a lot of dangerous actions and even wars and conflicts and violence in the name of religion and of spirituality. So being scientific, being open-minded, always inquiring mind, nothing is final, we are always searching for truth, that is a very important part of science. So I would say, like walking on two legs, walk on two legs, science and compassion, together. When you have compassionate heart, then you will not create nuclear bombs, you will not create genetic engineering. You always say, science should take a, an oath, a Hippocratic oath, do no harm. Like a doctor, before becoming a doctor, after graduation, takes this Hippocratic oath, first do no harm. That is compassion. That is compassion. So if scientists, not only scientists, even business leaders, even industrialists, even politicians, everybody, all of us, should take this Hippocratic oath to say, first do no harm. Do no harm to yourself, first of all. Do no harm to other human beings. And do no harm to nature. That is compassion. A very broad, inclusive compassion. Do no harm to yourself, no harm to other people, no harm to nature. As long as you do no harm, then you are completely free to do research, do invention, do innovation, do discovery, do science, do technology, do politics, do economics, do industry, do business, do religion, do anything as long as it's doing no harm. This is a fundamental principle of compassion. So if you can take that compassion and science together, then science is very good. We need science, we need innovation, we need new ideas, we need new discoveries, but with compassion, with kindness in your heart. So I would say, dear friend, science and compassion are companions. They are not enemies of each other. They are companions, they go together, walking on two legs, walk with scientific mind, and compassionate heart. Science is a mind, measurement, and mind, and thinking, and analyzing, and a compassionate heart. We have both in our body. We have mind to think, and analyze, and, and experiment. We also have a heart for compassion, and kindness, and generosity, and, and feelings, and love. So use your mind, scientific mind, and use your heart, compassionate heart. Those two together, there's no, uh, there's no conflict between science and compassion. Fantastic. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Down in the front here. If we just wait for the microphone. Just while we're waiting for the microphone, I was thinking, Satish, when you were talking there, it was like yeah. bringing the two hands together. Yeah. It's yeah. bringing the science yeah. and it's bringing and it's the compassion. Together. It's exactly. two sides of one coin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So science is uh, uh, driven by economy. So, so science is driven by the economy. Yeah, so, yeah. So how would you change the yeah, economy? Yeah. So nothing should be driven by economy. Nothing, not science, not politics, not our lives, should not be driven by economy. Economy should be a means to an end. The end is human well-being, planetary well-being, integrity of nature, and all the other compassion values that we talked about. Those are the end goal. An economy is a facilitator, helps you to realize your well-being. So what is, at the moment, what has happened? 
we have turned that around. What should be the means had become the end. And what should be the end had become the means. So nature has become a means to an end, the end of economic growth. The humans have become a means, the end of economic growth. We have a department in every business and industry called HR. HR stands for human resources. So humans have become a resource for what? For running an organization, for making profit, for making money, for business, industry, government, whatever. I think that should change. HR should stand not for human resources, because humans are not a resource for money or economy. HR should stand for human relationship. And economy should be a means to enhance human relationship, human well-being, and planetary well-being, and natural well-being. So eco actually, economy is a misused word. When they talk about economy, they don't really understand. I was invited to speak at LSE, London School of Economics, and I asked them, do you know what economics means? And they don't. LSE, the university, famous university of the world, and professors and lecturers there, they don't know what economy means. They think economy means budget and finance and, and, and a kind of uh, projection of uh, financial institutions and banking and all that. I said, no, no, no. That's not economy. Economy word is a very beautiful word. It comes from Greek language. Ecos means home. And in the wisdom of the Greek philosophers, the entire planet is our home. And a nomi means nomos means management. So management of planetary home is economy. What do they have today? Today, they have no idea of planetary home. They are counting money, profit, business, banking, finance, budget, business plan projections, bottom line. That's not economy. That's actually money no me. <laughs> money no me, management of money. And money no me has been named as economy. So economy should be a means to an end. Money should be means to an end. And economy should go with ecology. And I said to LSE people, please change the name of your university. <laughs> Call it LSEE. -E. London School of Ecology and Economics, because ecology means knowledge of our planet home. How are you going to manage your planet home without knowing your planet home? And in your LSE, you don't teach ecology, you only teach economy. And that's not complete, that's not whole. And so you should teach ecology and economy together. And they have changed the name, call it LSEE. -E. They say it's too difficult. <laughs> so, Economy, in the true sense of the word, is a very lovely word, but the way we use it for money nomi, that's not good use. So I would say in the way we use the word should be a means to an end, and the end is well-being of the planet, integrity of nature, integrity of human society, harmony of human community, all those values should be at the top, and money, finance, budget, banking, bottom line, business plan, all should be a means to an end. If you can have that, then nothing wrong with money, nothing wrong with the economy. But the way we have changed the around, means have become the end, and ends have become the means. So humans are not means to an end. Nature is not means to an end. Nature and humans are supreme, and money and a budget and finance are the means to that. But if we have to change that. Great. Thank you. Well, so Honor to have you with us here in Oxford, and thank you very much for coming yet again and being a part it's of this. It's my pleasure. It's lovely, and we'll just give a big applause for Satish. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, 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 thank you.